each and every one of you this morning. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. Let me just put this down just a tad. Amen. What a blessing it is to be with you this morning. My name is Henry Falcone from Flame of Fire Kingdom Awakening Messengers. We are, it is a joy to be with the precious saints of God this morning. On our last day of this week's broadcast, we have free broadcast Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at the same time. And this particular series is a continuing series of, of what God started back in 2020 of the unfolding of God's glory roadmap. And this particular series that God is having me share is called the Arising of Joel's Army, the Arising Sons of God. And so um, we welcome you and we're so glad that you could be here this morning. Now I always check to make sure that we're on Facebook. So let me just double check because I have to read the comments from here. And yep, looks like we're there. Praise God. Okay. So glad that you could be with, with us. Please sign in. You know, let us know who you are, where you're from. We'd love to um, see you and pray with you, you know, and uh, keep you posted. And everyone that signs in onto our Facebook page, we add to our prayer list and we pray over you and your families. And we are always here for that. So please know that our this this love work of the Lord is here for you. And if we can serve you anyway, pray for you, help you. You know, please, you know, contact us, let us know. And at the end of the broadcast, we'll put on the information that you, you may need, you know, to to write to us, email to us, my, my personal email, and uh, as well as our website and all that good information. Good morning, uh, Donetta. Good to see you, my sister. Uh, praise God. It's, it's always a blessing to, to see you. And uh, though I can't see you, but be with you. I look forward to seeing you in New York. That's right. We'll be going to New York on May 2nd through the 7th, uh, 2022 for our, our New York, uh, um, uh, Greater New York Schenectady uh, Divine Convergence. And so hopefully those of you that have been watching our broadcast or, or, or reading our Facebook, you'll come out to this special gathering of the Lord where we just seek the face of God. It's the, it's, he's the only agenda. That's what he asked me to do back in 2020. He said, Henry, I just want you to come, you know, I want you to come and meet with me. And I'm going to, he said, I want you to come and meet with me. So I'm going to reveal myself to you. And the first one as your bridegroom king. And, um, you know, and he says, and, and, and I'm the, I'm the agenda seeking my face. There's no other agenda, but seeking me. No guest speakers, except the father, son, and the Holy spirit. He said, just come. And then put out an invitation. And those that, you know, will hear my voice and hear the invitation will come. And they did. And they have been. All over the country you know we've gone several places over the country we crisscrossed the country last year and this year too you know we started in we started in san francisco this year now we're going to uh it's connected in new york and our and we have our next location coming up and i'll tell you that pretty soon of where we'll be going next where the lord wants to meet us amen and we are excited about meeting with you too amen good morning nicole god bless you good morning donna glad you're here this morning everyone um so father we thank you for this this day, this hour, this moment in history, Lord, where the greatest change and transformation of the planet is happening. No darkness is covering the earth, Lord, in great darkness. Lord, there's a word that you're releasing to your people, arise, arise and shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord shall be seen, risen upon you. He said, dense darkness will cover the whole earth. He said, but nations shall come to your arising and kings to your brightness. Thank you for what you're doing, Lord. Thank you that you're transforming us, Lord. Thank you that you're here to complete us and finish us, Lord. Thank you that you've come. And we're meeting you in the air in the spirit, Lord. And as we're beholding your face, we're changing from glory to glory. Lord, as you come like a refiner's fire and full of soap, where, Lord, these, these areas of our life, weaknesses, bruises, hurts, wounds, Lord, everything that's not like you are coming into your fiery feet. And as a refining fire, you're refining us and you're removing the dross like gold and silver, that we'd be pure gold and silver, that we might bring offerings of righteousness to you, God. And we thank you for your end time work. We thank you for your finishing work. We thank you that you're the Omega God this morning. And you're completing us. We thank you that, Lord, that in Philippians 1, 6, you said, Lord, that he that has begun this good work in you will be, and you are faithful to complete it in us, even to the day of Christ, which is where we are now, Lord. 
Thank you for completing us. Thank you that you're working where we can't see. Thank you for changing us while we're sleeping, while we're, while we're walking, Lord. Things, the things that we need to see, you show us and you remove. The things that we don't need to see, you're removing it, Lord, by your love, by your glory, filling us, Lord, your pure holy love, melting us like wax before you, God. We thank you for your manifested presence. We thank you for your parousia, your surrounding glory. We thank you, Lord, for all you are. We thank you that you're opening up our eyes and we're seeing you, Jesus, as you want to be known in this day, in this hour, as we walk in the book of Revelations. You're, you're appearing to us, Lord, as a king of glory with eyes of fire, your face like the noonday sun, your hair as white as snow. Lord, a double-edged sword coming out of your mouth. You're holding the seven stars of the seven churches, the church age in your hand. Your, your white robes are glistening white and you have a gold sash, Lord, around your waist, representing glory. And your feet are burning like an oven. And today your voice is like a war trumpet. I thank you that you're revealing yourself to us as the King of glory. Open our eyes to see you today as the King of glory. Open up our hearts so that we would let the King of glory come in as it says in Psalm 24. Lord, let us lift up our heads and let us lift up our gates, Lord, and let you, the King of glory, come in. And I declare today, who is the King of glory? Who is the one that's standing there waiting for us to open the door and come in and sup with us and us with him? Who is that King, the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, strong in battle. The Lord of hosts, you are the King of glory. May we come into that oneness, Lord, as seeing you as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the finisher, the omega God. We've known you as the Alpha God. Now open our eyes to see you as the Omega God. Open us to see you and let us be able to receive all your finishing work that you said you would do on the third day. You said you've come to finish your course and that's what we want. We want you to complete us, Lord, so that this corruptible, this corruptible can be put off so we can put on the incorruptible, Lord. Lord, that our t testimony be, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. But Christ who lives in me in the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Let that sonship testimony be our testimony who loves me and gave himself for me. And let us have the bridal testimony of the two-sided the two -sided coin where we can say, I am my beloved's and his desires are towards me. So I pray today, Lord, draw us, Lord, draw us, Lord. We, by our body, soul, and spirit, we will run after you. O King, bring us into your chambers. Open up our eyes to see you like we've never seen you before. Open up our ears to hear you like we've never heard you before. Open up our hearts to understand you, Lord, like we've never understood you before. Lord, we see you, but we want to see you better. We hear you, but we want to hear you better. We know you, but we want to know you better. We want the more of you, God. So Lord, I thank you today when we pray for a fish, you won't give us a stone. When we pray for bread, you won't give us a serpent. So, Lord, I thank you that right now we receive by faith everything that we're asking of you today, God. And to you who can do exceedingly above all that we can think or ask, to you, Lord, <clears throat> be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, I want to answer some questions today, you know, for some folks that I feel like the Lord is saying. You know, are you, so they can say, are you against people going to church? Of course not. Of course not. I'm against people going to church. You know, it says forsake not the gathering of the believers. Okay. You know, um, are you against going to church? Absolutely not. But what I'm trying to say is, what I've been trying to share to you is what does it mean to gather together? And in and, and 1 Corinthians 14, 26, it says, when you gather together, everyone have something, a psalm, a hymn, a doctrine, a teaching, you know, so that the whole body can be built up. So it's let the whole body function. If you read 1 Corinthians 14, 26, it says, you know, let them function. Let the prophets speak. Let, you know, let the tongues come, interpretations. The gathering of the saints is to be much more, okay, than going in and having a six, six songs. 20 minutes of announcements, a 40 minute message, okay? Uh, 10 minutes of uh, offering and 30 minutes of praying, praying for people to try to get them out in two hours so that they can go about their business. If that's what going to church means, 
if that's what the Lord, if that's what the Lord says is a structure that he wants to meet his people with, then I would say yes. But I believe that structure that we've been using for years and years and years and years and years actually now is hindering people from becoming who they are in the Lord. It's not the gathering of the saints together or the gathering of the church together. It's what we do when we gather together that the Lord's been addressing. He's trying to show us that there's a new wineskin of our gathering together. We must gather together. It's beautiful to gather together with the Lord. It's just when we gather together with the, God, the Lord, what are we doing? Are we teaching people that they're calm, that this is what they can endure? This is what the Lord looks like when we gather together. Everybody sit down. Everybody stand up. Everybody sit down. Everybody stand up. Somebody share a testimony. Okay, here's the song services. And we listen to the Christian radio and we hear the latest songs from Bethel or whoever your favorite group are. And we practice it and practice it so that we can sound like that. And then we bring that worship that's current and relevant, that relates to people, to the people. And then we want to make sure that the church is culturally relevant, that we're reaching people on their terms and on their ways. Is that what Jesus did? Really, is that what he did? Did he become like the world to teach them of his kingdom? Did he bring the things of the world into his message and his workings? I don't think so. So it's not about the gathering. It's about what we do, what our priorities do. And it can become so, what started out so beautiful. I was talking to Donna with this this morning and I just want you to think about this question. Do you think when they gather together in the caves, you know, where they were hiding and they were gathering together, worshiping the Lord, listening for his word, listening what the apostles' doctrine was and teaching. Do you think when they left their, left that meeting, did they say these questions? Boy, wasn't that a good service? Boy, worship was great today. Boy, that message was spot on. Do you think that was a conversation of what happened when they left the presence of the Lord? Do you think that when they got up, that they said, oh, wow, are we going to church today? And do you think that when they gather together that their priorities was to go and to hear a message and then go about living life as usual? Or did they come because they were in love with God? Did they come because they wanted to hear more about him, see him, know him from those that have walked with him and talked with him? Did they want to hear his words of what the kingdom of God was, what life was about, about the message, that the, the message of, of love and loving? and experiencing that love together and pure holy worship. Many of the things that we see church today as, many of the things that we talk about what a good church is and what a good service is, you know, would not even be the vocabulary of those that walked with Jesus in that day because they weren't concerned about going to a place or spending an hour of time or two hours of time and then living life as usual. They met in those catacombs because they loved God and they were running for their lives. And they were living a Christian life, demonstrating a Christian life. Not one with 10 points. Not one with here's step one, step two, step three, step four, step. It was much deeper than that, much profound than that. Because that word that was coming forth was a living word. And the spirit of God was welcome. And the spirit of God was with them. And they were, they were walking in the glory and spirit of God in such a powerful way that their lives were transformed. And they desired more and to live and demonstrate that life. Now, we say all of those words in services and we make that our priority, but the means and the power source of doing that has changed. The power source that began that work was the fire of God and the Holy Spirit's leading in power, filling apostolic men and women and prophetic men and women and pastors and teachers and evangelists. And they functioned together as one body. There was a corporate body. Many times when they gathered together, it said, as they fasted and praised and worshiped the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said. And when they left those gatherings, they know they had been with God. But when they went today, when we leave our gatherings, do they know that they've been with you, that they've been with the, with the pastor? I used to long for when I was done preaching the message as a pastor, that I would go to the back door and people would say, that was a great message. Because I wanted to know if it really touched them. And so I sit there, they say, great, great message, pastor, great message, pastor, great message. 
And then one day, in my prayer time, the Lord said, next time they say that, ask them what the message was. And so I did. And I, I, so, so I put it to test. Say, a great message, Pastor. I said, yeah, what was it about? Do you know they couldn't answer me sometimes? They only got part of it? Did they really hear? And what was I doing? I put everything in place that I was taught. I had the worship team. We had the youth group. You can ask Donna. We had senior ministry. We had every single ministry in place. We let the Lord move. We, you know, we let the Holy Spirit operate. Okay. But the goal, I, you know, I would stay in the back. I got the worship team and I'd wait for the high point of the message and come out and then bring them, take over the microphone and sing with everybody. And then the focus was the message I was going to bring to the people. That was the whole focus point of what was God going to say to us through this message. And can you believe that I had a true prophet of God come in and look me in the face? And I know many don't want to hear this and you don't have to, but I'm going to say it anyways. He looked me at the face, said, Brother Henry, said, no longer are you going to produce an Ishmael, but you're going to produce an Isaac after your own kind. But the Lord is coming to this church and he's going to uproot the foundation. And many are going to have an opportunity to be a Judas to this ministry. And many are going to leave. And you're going to be in your office crying and weeping, say, Lord, they've all gone. They, they've all gone. But the Lord wants you to know in that day, okay, he wants you to know that he is still with you. Do you know that word came to pass? It did. Ask Donna. And all of a sudden, you know, you know, we were letting the spirit of God move. You know, we had a, a real experience with God. Our services went from two hours to we just took the time limits off and the Lord came and there was, you know, we, we, sometimes it would be five, six hours and we couldn't move and the body was building itself up in love and we're getting a taste of what the Lord is doing now. And it was wonderful. And people's lives were changing, but soon people began to say, you know, we really love coming, but can you kind of keep it within two hours? And I thought about it. I said, man, they can't take more than this. Listen to what I just said. They can't take more than this. So if I, I had a choice right then and there, do I want to put my hands and limits on our experiencing God, knowing God, and walking with God? Or was I going to allow the Lord to come, be there as long as he wants to be manifested presence and let those who want to stay, stay. And let those that want to leave, leave. And so we did it. And eventually a lot of people left. And then some other things happened and more people left. Not because of us. But all of a sudden, I remember, I'll never forget it. Donna, you remember this. We had the choir, the, the, the musicians, the singers, the dancers. You know, we had the youth group. We had the senior ministry. We had the evangelism. We had everything I was taught, everything that I had done as an assistant pastor, everything I had known. I put it all into place. And it was functioning. And at that time, we had over 200 people in our church. And remember, in my area back, back in the 80s, you weren't a real church, according to the apostles of the era. You, you weren't really a church until you had 200 members in your church. So I did everything I could to get to 200 members. We knocked on doors. We did evangelistic outreaches. I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things. I'm just telling you, I did those things. But what was God asked after? What was the motive of why you're doing those things? What is Ishmael? What did Ishmael do that Isaac didn't? Ishmael, okay, was his father's favorite. And, you know, and he made a special meal for his father. And the father loved Ishmael more than Isaac. The mom loved Isaac more because she was the son of promise. You know, they both were, but, you know, she was drawn to Isaac. And what Ishmael did is that. His name means his hands against every man's hands and every man's hands against him. But it's real simple. Okay. Ishmael was born of the work of a good idea. So Hagar could no longer produce a seed. I mean an egg. Abraham could still produce a seed. So why don't you just sleep with my hand handmaiden? And maybe God, maybe God will give us a son by a mixture of his promise and our efforts. Are you hearing me? A mixture of his promise with our efforts to bring that promise into existence. And what did that produce? 
in Ishmael. And so you see at the end of the church age, a church with a mixture of God's promise with our efforts. And fortunately, I was blessed to have a prophet identify that very early in my walk and Donna's walk with, with building with the Lord. And could you imagine God had to uproot a foundation of what we were building? And it wasn't easy. We had a Christian school. Donna, you know this, right? We had a, a building we had to pay for. We had a house. And within six months, from that 200 people, we went to 60. Can you imagine the, the shock that takes to the building, to your finances? I mean, it, we, we suffered a lot from it, more than most people know. We lost a lot of things and that time, including our home. We lost our building, we lost everything. And I can remember when the two elders okay, came and they were so close to us and our families, our kids were knitted together, we were knitted together. They walked in my office and they said, Brother Henry, we're leaving. I said, no, you can't leave. I said, no, you guys, you guys have been with us for so long. Why, you can't leave, you know? And they said, I said, why would you want to leave? And this is what they said. They said, there must, be, every, there must be something wrong with you. Everybody else left. I was devastated. They left. I mean, I fell on my face, just as the prophet said, in my office. And I wept and I wept and I wept. And I said, Lord, they're all gone. They're all gone. And you don't have to believe me. That's okay. God knows. But in that moment, I heard the audible voice of God. And this is what he said. He said, but Henry, I'm still here. I'm still here. And that's all I needed. That one circumcision of God removing and cutting away the Ishmael saved my life. It saved Donna's life. It saved us from so much of the artificial stuff that men have brought into the church. The merchandising of the anointing, the selling of the anointing the profiteering of the anointing, the, of the desire to build something big and glorious for God. He cut out the root of Babel so that, that we, we would say, let us make bricks. Let us build a wall. Let us build a city. Let us build a, build a tower that reaches up to God and let us make a name for ourselves. What is Ishmael? It's the promise of God worked in the flesh. It's the promise of God. It's the word of God worked in your own flesh and what that really produces is compromise what that really produces is lukewarmness because it's a mixture of flesh and spirit and that's exactly where the church is at the end of the church age a combination of god's word of what he said worked in our own efforts and our efforts to repro to, re to produce a child to produce sons and daughters but if we take what God says and bring it to a Hagar, our Hagar or whatever that is of our own efforts to try to bring into existence what only God can bring into existence, then we too will produce an Ishmael. And when I look back, what was the Ishmael? Was it the worship team? Was it the other programs that we were doing? Was that the problem? The outreaches, the singing, the musicians, was that the Ishmael? No. The Ishmael was this. The Ishmael was that, that I built exactly what I was taught to build in my own efforts. And I put all of it in place myself. Really, in Donna, thinking that's what God wanted. We put it in place. And, 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 and we were content and we were getting, getting satisfied with what our hands had built. It looked glorious. It looked good. And God was there, but so was the flesh. Because in that system, people were looking to be the worship leaders. I had a lady come into the middle of the church, and I'll never forget it. And she said, I'm your worship leader. She brought her tambourine and she played her tambourine off beat. She couldn't even play on beat. And she came up to me afterwards and said, I'm your worship leader. I said, no, you're not. I said, no, you're not. I said, you're not our worship leader. I said, you can't even, you can't even uh, play the tambourine correctly. I said, you're off beat. 
And I mean, I heard the spirit speak to her and she goes, I am your worship leader. God sent me to you. I said, God did not send you to me. Somebody sent me to you, sent you here, but it's not God. And then she began to curse and put, try to put curses on me and the church for not, you know, receiving her as our worship leader. In that Ishmael structure, I had people come up to me and, and, and when they were to be corrected, you know, about what they were, maybe they, what they heard from the Lord, like you know, what they were saying was just out, out there. And they said, what I got from God is, no, is absolutely God. And I said, why, why would you say that? Because I prayed this prayer. God, don't let anything come out of my mouth that's not you. And so I know that everything that comes out of my mouth is God. And I said to him, I said, you're deceived. God's not even going to answer that prayer. It's because it's not his word. He said, let the spirit of the prophets be subject to the prophets. He says, test prophecy. You say not to test it. I said, you're deceived. That's what Ishmael produces. It produces a people who think they understand God in their mind. They take the word of God in their mind. They operate the word of God in their mind. They take it, what which is divine and holy, and they bring it into mind in their under, un, <coughs> understanding. And they try to build what they, try to build it in their own hand. Isn't that why it says, unless the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. And so in a church system, in a church function, we've taught people this, okay? This is what God wants. He wants you to gather together. Do not forsake the gathering of the believers. If you are not in a local church, you are out there. You are deceived. You are a lone ranger. You're all of these things. Why? Because you're not going to a local church. I understand the scriptures. It says forsake not the gathering of the believers. They're right. They're right. But they're saying if you don't belong to a local church the way they think it, then there's something wrong with you. But I want you to understand when you read Revelation chapter two and three, he is speaking to the church, every single local church. Those words in Revelation chapter two and three with Jesus standing there, like I described him in Revelation chapter one is a call to repent, to change and to overcome. Because when he looks at what the church is in his sight, it's not near what he, what he desires. And it starts in Revelation chapter two in the book of Ephesians, where we're in the book of uh, to the church of Ephesus. He says these words. He says, I know your industry, your toil and your trouble and your patient endurance and how you cannot tolerate wicked men and have tested and appraised those who call themselves apostles yet are not and found them to be imposter imposters. Have you noticed today? Everybody's an apostle. It's amazing how many apostles God just instantly made. They used to be pastors, but now, and then they were doctors, and then they were bishops, and now they're apostles. It's amazing. He says, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name, and you have not fainted or become exhausted or grow weary. Now, if the Lord stopped with the church of Ephesus, and he said, I know your works. They're more numerous, and they're greater than they were. And I know that you tried those who said they're apostles or not. If he had stopped there, you would have said stamp of approval. But I want you to listen carefully to what the Lord says and how serious this is. He says, nevertheless, I have this one charge against you. That you've abandoned me. The love that you had at first, you've deserted me, your first love. Now, how can the Lord come into send a prophet to me and said, no longer are you going to produce an Ishmael. But you're going to produce an Isaac after your own kind. Can I explain that to you? Because it helps us see how God will take us and make us arising sons of God. When I was at home, my I was hungry for God, thirsty for God. And in my own time, I would worship, minister him. I had no idea what a psalmist was. I had no idea what really ministering to the Lord was, but I just sang my heart to him and I would be overwhelmed in his presence. He would come so powerfully. I sit and lift my hands and he'd come and he'd talk with me and he'd minister with me and he'd fellowship with me and he'd talk with me and he'd reveal, he'd open up the word. The word would burn like fire within me. I would sing my heart and I could feel his tangible manifested presence. I, there were times I saw angels, you know, come through the room. I heard a choir join within me. I was experiencing God so personally and so intimately. And that was the Isaac. 
But when I went to church and my idea of what going to church was, going to church and my idea was gathering together and I was taught this, you got to keep it under two hours. You have to have a certain section of songs, three fast, one medium, three slow, you know, keep it about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, then bring the announcements. After the announcements, take an offering. Then to, after the offering, bring the message. After the message, pray with the people. It was a form of worship. It's, it's the holy place ministry where it's a ritual act of worship. And we did that Sunday, Wednesday, and every time we gathered. The message changed, the songs changed, testimonies changed, but the structure was the same. And to me, it was the Ishmael structure. That's what I come to identify it as. Now, I know this is an offensive word I'm saying today, because as pastors that are watching this or apostles, you're saying you are against God's gatherings, you're against the church. I am not. You can say it. It doesn't make it true just because you say it, because I'm not. And if anybody knows me, they know that I'm not. If anybody knows me, I pray for the local church. If anybody knows me, I love the local church. And I love, and when God gives me the opportunity to go in local churches and, and minister, I, I, I thank God for that. And when God sends me, I know that God, they experience God in a new and a deeper way. Not because of me. It's because of what the Lord desires to do. And I just share with them how to get closer to God. That's really all I do is share with them how to find him. And in those gaps, when, when that's allowed, people said, I have not felt God like this in years. Why? I have, God was in the testimonies. Surely the Lord was in this place. I don't hear a good message, Pastor. They, they, the testimony is I've met with God. And as a FIFO minister, that is our function, to bring them to the Lord, to teach them how to find God, to know God for themselves, and to experience to the Lord individually and corporately so that they can hear God, know God, know his ways. We're to show them how to walk with God, you know, find God, know God personally. And when that stopped happening in the church and we replaced it with a system where people come and they sit down and they become spectators and you do all the teaching and you do all the preaching and certain select people do all the worship and all of that. And, and if you have a large church, that might be 100 people out of 10,000. If you have a small church, that might be 15 out of 100. And these are the ones that do the work of the ministry and everybody else sits and everybody else takes notes. Explain to me how that is what happened when Jesus was on the earth and his disciples when they gathered together. Explain to me, show me, that's what they did. Show me the formula of what we now call church services in the Bible. Show me that pattern. Show it to me. You won't find it. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 is the pattern in the New Testament. You'll see it. But just because we did it for all these years doesn't make it right. I'm not saying God hasn't moved in it because by his grace, he moved through it. Wherever he was welcomed, he came to the degree where he welcomed it. It was a combination of flesh and spirit. And it lasted for 2,000 years. And from 300 to about 1,500, it was really dark under the Catholic Church. There was hardly any hearing of God. Think about it. 1,200 years of dark ages where there was hardly any voice except God had left a remnant. And if it wasn't for Martin Luther getting the revelation of being saved, we wouldn't be here today. And since 1,500 to 2,500 years, God has to restore everything that we lost. But yet, even with that, beloved, you know, we stand in the, in, in the day of the book of Revelation, in the end times, and the Lord looks over his seven churches and he says these words. But nevertheless, I have one charge against you. You've deserted me. You've abandoned the love that you had for me at first. How could that ever happen? Simple. Ishmael, you put the needs of men, men's understanding, men's wisdom above God. I am watching pastors after pastors trying to look at what's going on in the world, coming up with seeker friendly, seeker sensitive churches, churches that are palatable. I'm watching churches embrace things today that are against the Bible. Come on, are we playing games here this morning? Things that are sin and dark to God are okay now? We don't have to, we don't have to preach against the sin 
of, of, of fornication and all the other kind of things that are out there. And I understand, I, I picked that one, but you could say lying. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All of them are sin. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. Is that the Bible says, and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. What is that? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What are we giving them when we gather together? The law of the spirit of life? Or are we giving them 27 ways of fixing themselves like the world does? When we yeah. have more books in the Christian bookstore of how-tos than, than people really experiencing the reality of God. And that's why divine convergence is, I believe, are a tool because this is where they're experiencing the reality of God, the experience of God, where they can meet God face to face. I'm not saying don't gather together. First of all, nowhere in the Bible does it say go to church. Nowhere. It says don't forsake the gathering of the believers. So we're not supposed to go to anywhere. We're supposed to become the ecclesia. We're supposed to become the church, the living light of God, the breath of God, the body of God needs to fill us. We need to become the expression of, of, of the Lord on the earth by being knowing him, being filled with him, changed by him by living and walking in the glory of god being filled with the glory of god knowing him being filled with the manifested presence of god individually and corporately so that our lives become the reflection of his life on the earth our gatherings on sunday should be the reflection of his life on the earth but it's it's become more of an information station an information of what we're doing, what, why we're doing, what we're doing, how many outreaches we're going to have, how many people we're going to reach. I will never forget this. I walked into a huge church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Donna and I went there. And when God had sent me to find this pastor, gave me a dream over and over again, you know, about this young pastor that was really, he, he had experienced the Lord, the church was moving in the Lord. And, uh, you know, and he was about, you know, he wasn't sure whether or not to continue to do that or go back to what they were doing. And the Lord said, go tell him to keep doing what he's doing. Can you imagine God loving this man so much that he would send Donna and I from Connecticut and a team with us, two people with us to go and give that man that message? Can you imagine that, beloved? And so we spent three days trying to find him. And somebody said, well, there's a church outside of in between Minneapolis and St. Paul. And they're 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 huge you know, huge, as my wife would say, they are huge, you know, and um, and they experienced what happened in Toronto. That may be where you went. And so, OK, so Don and I and our team went there and I walked in and I walked in and I'll never forget. There are TV screens blaring. Welcome to our church. We have 10,000 members and this is what we're doing. We are we are building churches here in Africa and we're going to reach 16,000 people this way and and it was it was a infomercial. But I walked into uh, uh, the the church of Walmart. It had everything. It had the Christian bookstore, it had the coffee shop, uh, it had everything you would ever want. If you are if you're a pastor and you're looking at church from man's eyes of what successful is, this is it. This is success. Look at all the people. We listened to the choir. I mean, they, they had a pit. They had an orchestra pit. They had like 200 people singing and they sounded like Hillsong. It was, you know, I mean, technically it was beautiful. But you know, when we walked in, not one person said hello to us. Not one. And Donna said, this isn't it. And she walks out. <laughs> I'm not staying. And her and, her and the other sister went out and me and the brother said, let's just stay a little longer because maybe we're going to meet somebody here that maybe God will show us. Well, we stayed about 10 more minutes and we walked out and now we have to go home tomorrow. And I was really discouraged. I, said, I really missed it. I mean, Lord, I thought you, you, you know, I, I really thought this was you. You sent us out before and it, it, it's always happened. That morning, Donna had a dream of a brown church you know, like a really traditional looking church and a bucket of water pouring over it. And 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 she didn't know why she had the dream. So I'm ready to leave and I, I'm getting ready to go onto the highway. One way is Minneapolis, one way is St. Paul, but it doesn't tell you which way. And so I said, I am not gonna get onto that highway. I'm gonna pull over and try to figure out where we are. I pull over to the side of the road after I go over the, the overpass. And the Lord said, turn your head to the left, just like that, turn your head to the left, I turned. And there is a brown church building. And the spirit of God came over me and goes, that's where it is. And Don and I and our team went up there 
and we parked in the parking lot for a while and we saw this man with blue jeans on and um you know he had a regular shirt on and he's looking at us and and so i and don is pushing me go out go out and see if they're having service tonight and so i said okay and so i said hey how are you doing i said is there service tonight and he kind of goes well uh kind of uh well I, I wouldn't necessarily call it service he said but what we're going to do is we're going to come spend time in the presence of the lord and we're going to worship him and kind of just let you know see what the lord wants to do he said you know you know um you can come in if you want to i said we'd love to so there was about 10 people come in and he's ready to start he welcomes everybody he said listen we're just going to spend time loving on the lord and this this little older man comes out with his blue jeans and his you know he's got one of those what do they call those things with the straps i forgot what they call them you know overalls whatever and he sits down and he starts playing there's a river flowing god's presence comes i just left the church of ten thousand. i just left what man would dream where god would be and the presence of god comes here and they sing and they worship i'm sitting there and the lord speaks to me and you know what he says he says the pastor's checking you out he's asking me about you he's asking me why you're here he's going to ask you to come up and preach and share what i give you when he asks you just ask them to do one thing he said when he asks you ask them if they will pray for you and your team when you leave sure enough donna you're my witness to this he finishes worship he says, Brother Henry, I've never done this before in my life. He says, but I was checking you out. He said those words, I am checking you out in the spirit. I asked God why you were here. God told me he sent you here and that you have a message and a word from us. And I never do this. I don't let anybody ever get behind my pulpit that I don't know. But God sent you here. Would you please bring the message God sent you here for? I just began to weep. I said, I will. But will you pray for us when we're done? He said, absolutely. And I brought with him the word and the message that God gave me to him and said, brother, what you're doing is the heart of God. He sent me all the way from Connecticut when I lived in Connecticut to bring this word to you in the church. That's how much he loves you. That's how important what you are doing is that you are breaking out of that structure. You're breaking out of that structure uh, of six songs, everything I just talked about. And God is pleased with you because you're welcoming him and you're leading the people to find him. God sent me how many miles is Minneapolis from Connecticut? I went at my own expense, paid for it, but yet because God sent me as a messenger to this man. And because of that, he was able to stay on course with the Lord. How was I able to do that? Because I know the difference between Ishmael and Isaac. I built the Ishmael. I'm not saying we shouldn't have people sing. I'm not saying we shouldn't have people that play instruments. I'm not saying we shouldn't have you know, activities that God wants us to reach the lost or for the youth. I'm not saying those things okay, are wrong. I'm saying, but when I build them in the mixture of the flesh and the spirit for the, for the motives of being successful for whatever that is, then it is not pleasing to the Lord. It's an Ishmael. And it says in the book of Galatians, never shall the son of a bondwoman ever inherit the promises of God. Because one was born out of slavery, and the, which was Hagar, and the other one was born out of freedom, which is, you know, from um, Sarah. So Sarah has her children, and the slave woman has her children. And that is a mixture in the body of Christ. What caused that mixture? You listen to this. It says, I have one charge against you, that the love you had first for me, you've deserted me your first love. You've deserted me your first love. How serious is the Lord about this truth? That, and, and this is where I think we have a hard time grasping it. And this is why many people have left the local church not because they don't want to gather with others, not because they're rebellious, not because they're stubborn, not because they're not under authority. They left it because they have realized that that, that church or that local place has lost its first love. And God has called them out of that place because of the hunger and the thirsting and the desperation of their heart to know and see and be with God. 
They didn't stop wanting to tell people about Christ. They didn't stop wanting to see people healed or delivered. They didn't stop wanting to read the word of God. They didn't stop wanting to gather with believers. They didn't stop wanting to do the things that the gathering is supposed to do. They just needed to find the place where that was welcome. They had to find a place where that was welcome. So to label them rebellious, and to, to label them you know, out of order and not under authority is such a detriment and it hurts the body of Christ. It hurts the saints of the Lord who are passionately seeking the Lord. And just because God called them out of a place like in Sardis, a church like Sardis that had a reputation of, uh, that's alive and dead, or they called them out of a church of Thyatira where they were tolerating the spirit of Jezebel, where that false prophet's voice was speaking and all type of sexual sin like you see today is accepted and welcome. And they eat food sacrificed to idols. Just because God, God called them out of that type of church system you know, or one that was lukewarm, ready to be spewed out of the mouth of God, or one that lost its for love, does not make them rebellious. It does not make them uh, not under God's authority. They're just not under demonic authority or a mixture of God's authority and man's authority. Say what you want. Call me crazy if you want to, but I'm telling you, God is not bringing this end time harvest into the church that we see in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 that will not repent because the last word of Revelation chapter 3 is not everything's fine and dandy. I'm in love with your church the way you're doing things. I'm in love with all that you're doing. I see some things that are good, but if you really get to the nitty gritty, if you keep these things amidst of you, I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. I will remove my candlestick with from you. I will take what you have and and remove that from you. I will spew you out of my mouth. I know we don't want to hear that word. I know it's an offensive word, but it's the truth. It's Jesus, the King of glory, standing in the midst of the church with eyes like fire who can see the pure, pure motives of the heart. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why have these things come into my house? Why have you brought these things? And this is like Jesus standing in the house, giving us a chance to overthrow the money changers and the lenders. If he did it in the natural in his day and he drove them out and he said, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. If he did that in his house in, this, in that day, what would stop him from doing it in his house in this day if we've done the same thing? Why is that offensive to you, pastor and leader? Why is that offensive to you, Christian brother and sister? Am I saying I'm against the assembling of believers? Does this sound like I'm against anybody? I am not. And neither is the Lord. He is for us. He's just telling us the truth we don't want to hear. He's just telling us our spiritual condition we don't want to see. Because it says, to them I speak in parables because they have eyes to see, but they don't see. They have ears to hear, but they don't hear. They have hearts to understand, but they don't understand. So I speak to you and and I speak to you in and the secrets. He says, to you is it is to be made known the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them I speak in parables. Ezekiel 44 is exactly right, and 42 as well. Exactly. Do I sound like I'm against somebody? Am I trying to hurt you? Does this, is this hurting you? Do you think it was easy for me to hear? And the prophet said it in front of everybody. He didn't even take me off to the back room to tell me it. Right, Donna? And I said, Lord, why did you have to say it in front of everybody? And you know what his answer was? I mean, you want to hear an answer that you may not be ready to hear? He says, because you built it in front of everybody. And because you built it in front of everybody, I had to say it in front of everybody. Wow. But I knew in here, he was right. I didn't know why it was right. I don't think Donna knew why it was right. They said, no longer are you going to produce an Ishmael. What's Ishmael? Taking the promise of God and bring it into your intellectual mind and then trying to make it happen. God wants to evangelism, but what does the evangelism going to look like in the day of the Lord? If you read Isaiah 40, 
It says, because we're so filled with the glory of God and the glory of God is being seen risen upon me. He said, nations are going to come to your brightness and uh, uh, to your rising and kings to your rising. What does that say? That, that perhaps that right now in this time of preparation and positioning, God wants to fill us with his glory. The king of glory wants to come in and be the Lord of hosts and are allowing him to come in and sup with us and to change us and finish us and complete us. That glory, that tangible glory, that Perusia glory will be seen on us that will draw all men to him. We won't have to do all of these efforts like we've done in the past. We'll be carrying the glory of the Lord that will draw all men because he's going to be lifted up. And he says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. I'm not saying we won't preach. I won't say we won't be ministered, but we will be, be carrying the Shekinah glory, the, the Perusia of the Lord. And said, nations will be attracted to your arising and kings to the brightness of your glory, of his glory being seen upon us. Now, doesn't it make sense that maybe evangelism as we've known it to be is about to change? Maybe pastoring as we've known it is about to change. Teaching as we've known it to be is about to change. You know, apostling the way we've known it is about to change. Prof prof prophets and prophecy is about to change into the higher glory realm functioning from the seven spirits of God, from the spirit of prophecy, for, for, for when God has a leaders and people that living up here in that realm of, through that door standing open in heaven, where he can show them the things that are going to happen, that will come hereafter. Don't you think it's going to come with a different type of wisdom, understanding, power, authority, that will transform the kingdoms of this world, earth into the kingdoms of our God? Of course it will. Because why? It's a new wineskin. It has, a, then the new wineskin has a new function. It comes with a new hard drive and new software so that we can overcome the evil one. So we can overcome this world as Jesus said we're gonna overcome and work with him to transform the kingdoms of this world into the kingdoms of a God and work with him with his end time purposes. And so if that is true, and it is, then the way we gather together, which is the main part of, of where people come to gather, to hear what God is saying and doing has to change its form. God has to remove the mixture of flesh and spirit. He has to remove the ritual acts of worship. Now I have a question for you, pastor, apostle, prophet, teacher, and evangelist. If you looked at last Sunday's service and the Sunday before that, go back to your broadcast and show me where the structure is different. Show me where it's different. Show me that it wasn't one person speaking for the most part, everybody listening. Maybe you let a couple people share here and there. Time frame, structure, show me where it's different. Show me the buried ones that have been in your church were able to step out into their calling, into their purposes. And show me in your heart, if you'd be honest, that, that, that the most important thing of that meeting was for you to bring what God gave you. And maybe what some others have. Show me where it's different. In the true, I believe, let me put it this way, in the true desire of the Lord for us to come together in the gathering of the saints is to be worshiped as long as he desires us to worship him with real worship, pure holy worship, not songs, that just sing about what God's done for us, that's wonderful. But songs and heart and people pouring out their alabaster box of oil upon his feet, worshiping him with real love, that they don't have to sit in their seats, they can lay on their face before the Lord, they can dance before the Lord, they can wave their flags before the Lord. In pure holy adoration, the men servants and the handmaidens can pour out their tears upon the feet of God. And we stay there. And we don't move until the Lord moves. And then as he begins to work in and through his people, then someone speaks, another speaks, and they bear witness. And God begins to reveal his heartbeat. And we hear what's on his heart for today. And as he moves to a multi-membered body of Christ, we begin to see his heart. 
We begin to become connected with, with each other. We begin to be knitted and fitted together. The fivefold ministries and pastors are able to share what God has given them as part of the larger picture. It's not the whole picture or the whole focus. It becomes part of the picture that strengthens, lifts up, gets underneath the body of Christ so that each person that's gathering together, you know, can become and function the way God created them to function. Each part supplying what the other needs. And when they're in that parousia, that presencing of the Lord, that glory realm of God, we're being changed from glory to glory. Each one is getting to see the Lord and know the Lord. And this is a generation that will seek his face, Psalm 24. And when we're finished and when the Lord is done, we don't leave there saying, boy, wasn't worship great today? Do you think they did that coming out of those catacombs? Wasn't worship great today? Wasn't that a great message? No. That's not what they said. They Because that's function. That's focusing on a function or on what you received. When they left that place, they knew they had been with God. They left that place empowered with the Lord. And they didn't say how great worship was or how great the message was. They didn't wait for the apostles to sit at the back to, back to and say, wasn't that a great message, pastor? The focus wasn't on what men did or didn't do. The focus was on God and what he did. And I just described to you what a divine convergence was, by the way. But listen, beloved, if we're going to become and see the sons of God arise as an army of the Lord, <coughs> if you look honestly and we see our times with God's people as services, let's say that's what he wants, gatherings together. What should really happen in that gathering? Have you asked him? Are we in control and sometimes God in control? Do you remember what Ishmael is? It's the promise of God, the word of God done and try to be brought about by human efforts. Why? Hmm. Abraham can still produce a seed, but unfortunately, Sarah can't produce an egg. So we have to find another egg donor to deposit that seed in. And that egg don donor is the work of the flesh of what we can do, our efforts, our abilities to try to help God out. That's what I was doing. I was taught that. I don't blame anybody because that's what we have done. And again, God met us there by his grace. But it's always been something, a mixture. And so at the end of the age, and the coming of the Lord, the beginning of the book of the Revelation, Jesus, the Jesus, the King of glory, by his light, his brightness exposing, begins to show us our real spiritual condition. It starts in Revelation chapter two in the book of Ephesus with repentance. And he goes through all five churches, six churches of the seven, and calls them to repent. All seven churches hear a word, to he that overcomes, and there are promises attached to that overcoming. This is the message of the kingdom. It's right here. It's the present word of the Lord that God is speaking to his end time people. You can reject it, you can deny it, you can not want it, and you can continue to do business as usual. That's your business, that's your choice. But it won't be because that you haven't heard. It won't be because you haven't heard that Jesus is looking at the condition of people. It's not bad to tell you what's wrong. Love tells you what's wrong. Love tells you to fix what's wrong. And love gives you the power to fix what's wrong. It doesn't deny what's wrong. It doesn't accept what's wrong and call it right. And there are believers who have that within them. And God, they're in that seven church, <clears throat> local church system, <clears throat> and they know it. Well, why don't you tell them to stay and pray there until it changes? I can't tell them to do anything. There are some that stay in those, and that's exactly what we're doing because God told them to do that. But there are others that God said, you need to come out. You can't stay here. I can't, you can't grow in this atmosphere. And they have come out. And they didn't come out because they didn't like the pastor. 
There are some that did that. There are pe- listen. There are people who left because they didn't want correction. They didn't want the authority. They were rebellious. There are those that have been rebellious. They don't want authority. They they are out there. They're flakes. They're rebellious. There are some of those. But you don't label everyone that way, because there are those that are not in local churches who are nothing like that. God will deal with those folks. But there is a remnant of God's people that have been called out to come out of the camp to meet the Lord, like in Song of Solomon, to meet him, you know, where he is hand feeding these sheep himself. He's outside the camp. He's in the camp, okay, because his presence is there, but his person is outside the camp. And and that when the Shulamite bride sees him outside the camp, she begins to testify in Song of Solomon chapter one about what her church life experience is like. Again, I know this is not a pleasant word. And to those of you who are watching okay, um, today, I, 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 I pray that you hear why is God doing what he's doing in you? And how do we become these arising sons of God? How does the season change? I didn't have, you know, I, I, as I got up this morning, I just felt the Lord say, you've got to share about the church of Laodicea and the, and, 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 and the churches in, the, in, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. I want to listen to this Song of Solomon chapter 1 and verse 2. It starts with intimacy. This is Revelation 3.20 when you invite him in and you start giving him the worship. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. The odor of your ointments is fragrant. Your name is like perfumes poured out. Therefore, do the maidens love you. And then she begins to pray a prayer of desire. She's hungry and desperate for the Lord. Draw me. We will run after you. What's the we? My body, soul, and spirit will run after you. The king will bring me into his chambers. See, she's hungry. She's thirsty. She's desperate. When this prayer gets ignited in a believer and they're in a local church system, okay, that will not allow that to come by that form and structure. And even though God has been trying to get their attention, he will draw them out of that local church to find him. Because the, 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 our destination is him, not what we call local church. The destination is to find him. The local church is supposed to together as a corporate body, find him more than they did yesterday, his heart, his desires. And so she goes on to say, we will recall your, you, that we were favored with your love, more fragrant than wine. The upright are not offended at your choice, but sincerely love you. And then she begins to recognize her spiritual condition. She goes, I'm black and comely, and you are very pleasant. Oh, you daughters of Jerusalem, I am dark as the tents of Kedar, like the, the beautiful curtains of Solomon. And she says, please, to the Lord, don't look at me. She said, I am swarthy. I've worked out in the sun, I'm sunburned, and it's left its mark on me. And my stepbrothers, which represent, in this case, the present church leaders, okay, were angry with me. And they made me the keepers of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. What is she saying? She, she, get, she is getting the revelation because she sees the Lord. She's hungry for the Lord. And she sees him with certain sheep that are around him. And he's hand feeding them. She's in the midst of a church structure where she goes to church on Sunday. She may even have a ministry. She may even do the works of the Lord. But her own vineyard, her own life with the Lord, she's not keeping because the goal is to build the vision of the church. So her own vision, her own developing life, this is not in every local church. Now, there are many good pastors, and that, forgive me, that's not the right word. There are many pastors and leaders who are teaching people these things locally. So I'm not saying this to everybody, okay? So please understand me. But for the majority who are not doing that, okay? And they're making them to build the vision. And everybody has to become, a, I call it a, an, an, a, a, an automaton. 
Everybody has to speak the same, do the same, build the same, see the same. And if you don't, you're rebellious. If you're not doing these things, if you're not in church every Sunday, you're not faithful. If you don't clean the toilet, you're not faithful, that type of thing. Okay. And so she sees her spiritual condition that my stepbrothers are angry with me. Why? I'm hungry for God. I don't want an Ishmael. I want to become an Isaac. I want the Isaac. And she sees him. And where is he? Hand feeding certain sheep. How did the sheep get there? Because they desired more of the Lord. And so she says, don't look at me. My stepbrothers were angry with me. And they made me the keeper of the visions, vineyards. They made me the keeper of the vineyards. Notice what they did. Put them to work. You're not working hard enough. You're not doing more for God. If you really loved God, you would be working as hard as you can to reach every single person on the planet. And contrast that to what Jesus said. As the voice comes to me, I obey. I only do what is the Father's will, what's pleasing and satisfies his heart. His mission was to save the world. And he did. To those that will accept it. But Jesus' life was not trying to figure out what the Father said and do it in his own understanding. It was to receive the Father, being one with the Father, and doing exactly and only in the way the Father showed him to do it. So there's no Ishmael, just Isaac. And so she said, he says, addressing her, she says, tell me, O oh, you who my son, my soul loves, where you pasture your flock and where you make it lay down at noon. Huh. I thought she was amongst the flock. Right. Tell me, will you pasture your flock? Because she sees it. And those that have been drawn out of that church system that are under those things that are in Revelation chapter two and three were hungry. And they said to the Lord, where do you pasture your flocks? I want to be with you and where your people are, where you're feeding them like that. That's not a wrong desire. It's God's desire. Now, if your church or your ministry is doing that, then God will lead people to you and to that flock because they're doing this work. If you do what he asks that way, God will bring them to you and you to them. If you're not, he's not going to lead them to a, a place that deserted their first love in these last days. He's not going to lead them to a church that has a reputation that's alive but dead or tolerating Jezebel or tolerating the doctrine of Nicolaitans where we have a clergy above people and everybody else underneath. He said, I hate that. And he's not going to bring them to a church that's lukewarm, ready to be spewed out of his mouth. This end time harvest is coming into his glory. And where the glory of God is filling his people into gatherings that acknowledge his glory and have surrendered to his work in his heart fully. And where the body can function, each part supplying what the other needs. That's where the end behind harvest is going to be trusted to. Tell me, will you pasture your flock where it may lie down? For why should I be as a veiled one straying? Besides the flocks of your companions. Why should I be a veiled one? As, I, as if I have to have a veil over my face. Do you know when we look into that face of Jesus, the veil is removed? And we look into that face of Jesus as a mirror. And everyone that does is constantly being changed and transfigured from glory to glory. So if the face of God is our destination, the heart of God, our destination, when we gather together, then we will be changed from glory to glory. We will be equipped from glory to glory. We'll be enabled from glory to glory. We will hear the present word of the Lord. God will be able to release a word to us in season to those that are weary. He'll be able, the word that will come forth from each person's mouth, including the ministers, will be like Jesus speaking to the two men on the road of Emmaus. They'll be like fire that burns within them. It will be a life-changing word from the substance and the reality of who God is. And when they're in that gathering the left, they will surely say, surely the presence of God is in this place. They won't say, good message, Pastor. The testimony will be of Jesus. Am I against the local church? 
Am I speaking against gathering together? Am I telling everybody to stay home and have internet meetings? Absolutely not. Do not put words in my mouth. Be careful of how you're representing what I'm saying. I'm just telling you, be very careful how you're representing what I'm saying. Do not let the enemy pervert what I'm saying and twist these words in your ears. I love the fivefold ministry. I love the gathering of the saints. I am for gathering of the saints. But what God is having me teach and speak is Revelation chapter two and three of the condition of the church of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So why? So that he can remove the mixture. I need the mixture removed from my life. I need it removed from my family. I need it removed from this work. Any place is mixture, I want it removed so that we're not seen and Jesus is seen. He doesn't need my efforts in my own power and strength. He needs my efforts as he fills me with his power and strength so that my life becomes a reflection of his life. My hands become his hands. My words are his words. And all that I'm doing will be the will of the Father. That's what the arising sons of God in Joel's army carry. They carry that work of God within them. They are the ones that are going to be trusted with power and authority and dominion to be sent out to the nations because they've been prepared, they've been positioned, and they're now fit to be propelled with the glory of the Lord. And now God is coming to gather that remnant, whether they be a, a local church, whether they be a faithful minister, or whether it be a doctor, lawyer, housewife, mother, those that have been hearing this, those that have been that found the Lord outside the camp, those that have been developing that intimacy with God, those that have been changed by God, those that have been allowing the Lord to burn up, you know, all the dross that's within them, those that are preparing themselves like a bride, all adorned in white, the bride made herself ready. Those, that company of people, and everyone has the opportunity to be that, but those that do it, he's now gathering us together and bringing us together to form a wheel within a wheel and an army of the Lord. Because now he has a people that he can form and he has formed in Revelation 5.10 into a kingdom of priests, ministers to the Lord and kings who can walk out their sons. Bride and sons, they have the two-sided coins. They're bride and son and priest and king. That developing mature quality is now in them as priest, as a bride, and as a son, you know, and, and as a king. They can now walk in kingdom power, authority, and dominion because they've been equipped by God himself. And those saints are looking for shepherds outside of the camp that can teach them these things, show them these things, point them to God, take their hand, bring it up to God, and when they get fully the hand of God, let go and get out of the way. They don't see the sheep as building their ministry. They don't see the sheep as advancing their agenda. They see none of that. They don't see the sheep as being there for their purposes. When those that gather together for Team Converge, I want to assure you, I don't see everyone that's being part of this, whether they're pastor, as building this vision or mission. I see them becoming what God made them. I see us together, functioning together the way God desires. Each one of this part of this team functioning, building itself up in love, being knitted together in love. And it's not Pastor Henry's vision. It's not about building divine convergence. Divine convergence is not another thing. It's just a meeting with God. God saying, come to this place and meet with me. It's that simple. And in that, he can gather these saints. He can gather this remnant, these prepared ones together so that they can function together, operate together the way it was supposed to be, the way that it is to be in the gathering of the believers where Jesus is the head and we are his body. We minister as in David's tabernacle, the pure holy love of the Lord and, it, and it's rebuilt in our midst. And as we minister the heart of God, God comes and he speaks and God speaks to each person. God moves to each person and each one has a freedom to do and express what God has and what God is saying. And it's accurate and it's point on, on point. And if something is a little off or, the, Everybody is teachable and correctable because we're still learning. But we're functioning. We're not sitting. We're not spectators. We're functioning together. Isn't that what it's supposed to be? How is God going to send us as an army if we don't know how to function together? If you think having all those people sit down Sunday after Sunday and take notes is functioning, 
Beloved, please let God open our eyes to see that's not function. That's service. I guess that's why it calls it services. Because we're serving the one that's bringing us the message. Are you hearing? I see this as one God rebuked openly. Maybe that's why he's letting me share it. I built that. I did that. And God stopped me. He said, no longer are you going to produce an Ishmael, but you're going to produce an Isaac after your own kind. Do you know what happened? We got down to about 10 people. No, every single person I put in position left, every single one of them, go figure. Every leader, every person I picked left. So guess what? I don't pick anymore. I learned my lesson. Slap on the wrist, I got it. I'm not picking anybody. I looked at their giftings. I looked at their calling, but I couldn't see their character. And you may think, Pastor, you know the character, but one of the reasons why we get hurt over and over again by people betraying you and leaving, and we get mad and we write about it, we talk about it, is because we didn't see them the way Jesus did. We looked at them from the outside, just like Samuel did. When he said, surely, Eliab, this, surely this is the one, and the Lord said, that's not him. Man look at the outside, but God looks at the heart. Only God can pick and choose his leaders. And I pray that God would always give me the sensitivity to see who he's chosen. Not who I think he's choosing, but who God is choosing. And we get betrayed. Remember what he said, the prophet? He, he just didn't say, you're not going to build an instrument. He said to the people, Many of you will have the opportunity to, to be a Judas to admit to this ministry. Who wants to hear that? And he did it openly. And many got mad at me, angry with me. To this day, they still don't like me. That's okay. They don't have to. They have to love me, but they don't have to like me. That's okay. I love them anyways. I'm grateful for God to allow me that suffering of the removal cutting away the circumcision of the Ishmael from the Isaac. Because remember, God allowed Ishmael and Isaac to live together until he was 13 years old or 12 years old, ready for his bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah. And you know why the Lord came to Abraham and tell him to put away Ishmael? Because Ishmael was persecuting Isaac. Ishmael was persecuting Isaac. I'm just saying. Put away the son of a bondwoman of what your hands tried to produce in my name. For never would you have produced in my name, trying to bring my word into existence, will you ever inherit the promises of God, including his glory. So she prays, tell me, oh, you whom my, my soul loves, where do you pass your flocks? Where do you make it lie down at noon? For why should I be as a veiled one strained beside the flocks of your companions? And he answered her, if you do not know where your lover is, oh, you fairest amongst women, run along, follow the tracks of the, of, of the, of the flocks. In the pastures and, and 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 go by the pasturing your kids beside the shepherd's tents he's not ready yet she's not ready yet to fully meet him the way that she needs to meet him so she said he directs her go to the shepherd's tents outside the camp and they are going to show you how to find me they're going to help you to see me and know me they have a function and their function is not, you're going to go to them and they're not going to beat you like the stepbrothers. They're not going to make you fulfill their church vision. They're not going to see you as a means to an end. They're going to see you the way I see you. And they're going to help you to grow to know the Lord on your own. And they'll know when to put their hands and when they're not. 
And in that shepherding, the developing relationship of her as a bride to change, she's now able to receive directly from the Lord and through the shepherds who know the ways of God, who have gone before where she has. And those are the spiritual mothers and fathers of the Lord of the kingdom that God is rising up and maybe causing you to be. So those that are hungry, that realize and want to come out of that church structure system where they have not been able to grow, you'll be able to guide them to the Lord, to find them to the Lord. And notice he sends them to a place of fellowship. Hmm, it's just different than where she was. So many of those that have been called out didn't stop fellowshipping with people. They just found who they could fellowship with. And they found people on the internet and they found maybe pastors and ministers and different ways of connecting. And they have become an expression of his body together. They may not be able to meet in one place because they're not all in one place, but they do meet. And it's just as valuable in their meeting as any other meetings that we have. That's why they're not rebellious. That's why they're not stubborn. They've just been drawn out. And that has been happening for many years now. But now, because we're in a different day, what is the Lord doing? He's setting a table. And he's saying, all things are now ready. Come. And this remnant of God is hearing that call. And for us, that's why he told me to, I know it now. I didn't know this when he said it. I want you to meet me in New York. Why? Because I'm going to set a table there in New York, a special place with your name tag sitting at that banquet just for you so that you can come and meet him personally. And then everybody has their name tag on that table and we all can meet him personally or corporately together and be with our king. As one corporate bride. That's what the convergences are for. That's why he has me do them. So that we can meet him together. So this remnant, you know, maybe it's Cheryl, maybe it's Crystal, maybe it's Nicole, maybe it's Lynn. I don't know if it's Maybe it's Donata. I don't know who else is there. Maybe it's you watching this broadcast and you say, I need to go to New York. The Lord says, you need to go to New York. It's so that we can gather together in his name. When two or more, what? Gather together in his name. What does he say? There I am in the midst of them. Isn't that what we sh should see when we gather in his name? Can you see what we took of the world and maybe tried to organize our organize the gatherings into what we call services? I don't even like that word because I bring my car to be serviced. I don't want to bring myself to be serviced. I want to come and worship God. Love God, bless God with others who love him, even maybe more than I do. I want to be with those that are in love with him. I want to be ministers and that love him, that want nothing more than to be with him and that he is their entire life, not working for him as their entire life, but being with him is why they live. And because of that heart, God works in them and through them powerfully and they do do what god wants them to do from preaching and teaching or whatever we would call the work of the ministry is but they're not doing it the isaac the jesus who's one with the father is doing it within them that's what i desire to be with and walk with even if i wanted to do a church service and set the agenda for it. I couldn't if I wanted to, because I couldn't do it. It's not in me to do that anymore. Because there's such much more than that. Because I'm coming to find him. I thought you already have him. Of course I have him. I, I, I'm married to Donna every day, but I want to know her more every day. I want to love her more every day. I don't want to love her like I did when I first met her. I want to love her more today. I want to be with her more today. Why? Because we've grown in love together, to be together. I tell everybody I'm just a half a loaf without her. I, I don't like going anywhere without her. Why? Because we become one. I can't see going without her. And even when I do, if God tells her that she can't come, 
my heart is always looking to her like it looks to the Lord. I'm thinking about her, wanting to make sure she's okay, bless her. I never lose sight of her. But you can go to church and lose sight of God. You can lose sight of him. That's what he says to Ephesus. You've done all of these works. You try those who say they're apostles and they're not. And what does he say? That's okay? I don't mind you not loving me like you did at first. It's okay. Could you imagine? You know, Donna's saying to me, Henry, I know you don't love me like when you first met me, but that's okay. That's fine. I can live with you not loving me like you first did. Thank God I don't love her like I first loved her because that was disgusting in reality. It almost uh, caused us not to stay married. Because what I thought love was, was not what God said love was. That's another story for another day. But would you want her to, what if I said, I, I don't love you as much as I did yesterday? How's that gonna make her feel? You know what? I'm too busy right now to love you. You know what? I, I, I'd rather, I, you know, I'd rather go out and work harder for you so that I can buy you better things instead of talking to you and being with you and listening to you and what's, what's on your heart. Let me just keep buying you things, giving you things, and you'll be happy by those things. And God is happy by our things we do. When the most important thing of being with him isn't the most important thing for us. Having him as our first love isn't the most important thing in our life. Seeking first the kingdom of God is not the most important thing of our life and the Lord is gonna be satisfied with that. He's gonna be satisfied and say, Lord, look at what we built for you. Look at all the people. They, he even mentions that in the Bible. He says, many in that day are gonna say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out devils in your name? Haven't we done all of those things? And he looks at them and he says, depart from me. You workers of iniquity, I never knew you. We can't give God's Cain's offering the best of what we built. Cain knew what to bring God, but he chose to bring what was valuable to him, what he made, his idea of what God wants. He brought it before the Lord as an offering and God rejected the offering and Cain felt he was rejecting him. God never rejected Cain. He just rejected what he brought to him. First Corinthians says, be careful how you build upon the foundation, whether, whether it be, you, you know, because it's going to be tried by fire. Because whatever you build has to be built upon the true foundation of Jesus Christ, because in the day of fire, it's going to try what you built. And if it lasts, it will come forth as precious metals and diamonds. But if it's not from the Lord, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble, and it's going to burn up, and you are going to enter heaven only by escaping the fire. So God does judge what we're building and why, because of why we built it. Who's building it, him or us, Ishmael or Isaac or mixture? I'm sorry that's offensive to you. I'm sorry that that doesn't fit into your paradigm. This has to be successful. This has to be God. Lord, Lord, have we not done this in your name? It wasn't. And Cain's offering also wasn't accepted. But Cain should have known better. And if you read the Bible and you're seeking God, I should have known better. But I didn't know better. For whatever reason, I did what I was taught. I built the way I was taught. I didn't know that was an Ishmael. And thank you, Jesus, for sending a prophet to tell me what I was building was not what you want. I'm glad I found out then that, that when I stand before the Lord in that day, that it doesn't burn up. I'm glad that God changed me. I'm glad God worked in me. I'm grateful to God for what he's done. Because what I didn't know, that in my hallway, because I at that time I was living in a hallway, you know, not in a hallway, but my office was in a hallway of a two-story house. I was worshiping the Lord and God was coming. What he wanted, what he wanted me to do was to minister to his heart, listen to his voice. Everything that I was doing in secret, in my secret place, God wanted to bring out in the open to teach God's people that this is what God wants. 
to minister to its heart, to listen to its voice and to find him and to have the tangible presence and manifested glory of God in our midst so that he could do whatever he wanted with his people. And so I long for the day that I didn't play the keyboard, that I could come out of the office in the height of worship, take over and preach the message. All of that got ripped up and burnt out of me as a desire. And there I am left alone, me and Donna, you know, with a few people. And now I got to go play the keyboard again. But I didn't go to the written six song service. Nope, didn't do any of that stuff. I just played. And God said, I want you to worship me till I tell you to stop. I want you to minister to me till I tell you to stop. And I, I want you to let my people to share till I tell you to stop. I will let you speak what I give you till I tell you to stop. And then when I say you're done, you're done. It was really kind of simple. And I've done it since that day by the grace of God. By the grace of God. Does that make me better than anybody else? No, no. Like Paul, I'm like the chiefest among sinners. I shouldn't even be doing what I'm doing. I was a restaurant manager. I shouldn't even be here. I wanted to commit suicide. I should be dead right now, but by the grace of God, I'm alive. And it's only by God's grace that I'm even speaking to you today. He so loves us. And he so loves his people and he loves the local church, oh, but he doesn't love the structure that is keeping his people from him. He wants them to see him and know him and find him and be able to function the way God made them in the gathering of his saints so that he can be seen glorified in his saints not glorified in an apostle, not glorified in an individual, but glorified in his saints. That's his desire. He's not mad at us. He just wants to change us. And it's so serious. It's so serious that even though the works are more numerous, and even though you tried those that say that you're apostles, that they're apostles and they're not, it's so serious. That he says, remember from the heights you have fallen and repent. Pastor, he, he doesn't say, stay the same. Just like he told Cain, I can't accept this. I love you, but I can't accept what you're bringing me because it's the work of your hands in my name. And no flesh can glory in my sight. So no go and bring what you know is right. But Cain got angry. He got angry because he felt God was rejecting them and that's exactly what's happening today. Pastors and leaders are getting angry at this message in this word. And they're getting angry because their worth is attached to what they're bringing. Their worth, their value, their life is attached to the work that they do. And God is trying to separate the work from our worth. If he had understood his worth, he would have brought the same offering that Abel did. And you look at what Abel brought to the Lord. He didn't produce the offering. God did. He watched the sheep. And God wanted a lamb, not the best of a flock, not the best of his crops. Abel didn't make the offering. He just cared for it. Abel was to watch over the offering. And he had a much easier job than. Cain did. And that's why Cain was angry. You're accepting that and you're not accepting this. I have more people in my church than you do. I work harder than you do. We're reaching everybody than you do. And you're accepting that? That's not fair. And now that anger wants to murder the Abels. Isn't it interesting 
then in the Hall of Fame, Abel, Abel's blood to this day is still speaking. I'm just saying. Remember from the heights that you've fallen. Repent. Change your inner man to meet God's will and do the work you previously, previously did when you first knew the Lord. What did you do when you first met the Lord? You fell in love with him and you loved him. And you wanted to know him and you're hungry and thirsty for him. And you told everybody about him because you were so in love with him. The sin that's in the house of the Lord is that we put the second commandment above the first commandment. We're trying to love one another. You know, as Christ loved us, we're trying to love our neighbor as ourselves, putting the needs of men and their needs above the needs of God. We have lost God's need. And he's telling us in the book of Revelation what he needs. Chapter two and three tells us what God wants and what he expects and what he requires. And if we will obey him and repent and change, he said to he that overcome, I'll give him a right to sit down on my throne, even as I have overcome and sit down on my father's throne. That's where the arising sons of God will be found there because they will repent and change. And as they repent and change, they're going to be called out of those seven churches as we've known them to be, to open up the door to Jesus and have him come in as the king of glory. And as they do sup with him and pour that worship on him, he forms them into a kingdom of priests and kings unto our God, ready for these end time purposes. So we have a choice. We can hear the word of the Lord, deny this isn't God's word, reject it, that he's not trying to bring correction to the leaders in the house of God, the whole house of God. He says, remember, repent, change your inner man and work to do the works you did previously when you first knew the Lord. But there's an or else. And the or, or else is one of the most, to me, damaging things that could ever happen to you as a pastor or leader of people or local church. It says, or else I will come and remove your lampstand. The lampstand is the symbol of God's presence. I, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come and remove the lampstand from its place unless you change your mind and repent. Now I'm not supposed to say this. I'm not supposed to preach this because it's offensive, because I'm against the local church. Does that sound like I'm against them? I'm not against anybody. And these are not my words. What I'm sharing you are not my words. These are the words of our Father. These are the words of Jesus Christ. These are his words. So important that in this day, to become an arising son of God, three things are required. In the book of Revelation, chapter two and three, to rise up through the door open in heaven, repent, change, and overcome. Just so that you know, this is not me. I'm going to end here. I really went over today, but I, you know, it's okay. In Revelation chapter three, he speaks to the church of Laodicea. He says in verse fifteen, "I know your works of what you're doing. You're neither hot nor cold. Wish you were one of them." So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, look at what he says. I will spew you out of my mouth. That's Jesus. Yep. Did I write these words? Isn't this, isn't John writing down the words that Jesus, the king of glory, is revealing to him in the air as he meets him? He says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Does he want to spew us out of his mouth? No, he's just telling us what he's gonna do if we don't change. I will move your candlestick. I'll fight against you with the sword of my mouth. This, this is ask his people. Why? Because what you're doing isn't what I want or what I'm at, or, or, or acceptable. And what you're doing is leading people away from me instead of bringing them to me. This is what he sees. It's not what I see. My opinion doesn't matter. I owe 
I can't judge anybody. I can't judge anybody's church. The Lord does. Judgment begins where? In the house of the Lord. And he says, for you say, that's a heart condition. You are rich and you're in need of nothing. Everything's okay. God can't be upset with all we're doing, even though we deserted our first love and we love working for him more than him. And we put the needs of men above the needs of God. And we brought all the wisdom of the men into the church of God. We brought strangers and aliens into the house of God, but that's okay. As long as we reach the lost at all costs, we can just do whatever we want, bring in what we want, do it in our own wisdom. Strength. What's he saying? But you say you're rich in need of nothing. You're prospered. But you don't realize, listen to this, and understand, you, church, seven churches in his hands, last day's church, do not realize and understand that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Who's saying that? Listen what he's saying. He's saying you really haven't grown. Because this is when he says, I count you to buy purchase from me gold refined by the fire. Gold by fire always represents character or heart motives. I counsel you to get the right motives from my heart of why you're doing what you're doing. That's a command here. Repent, right? And he says, then I want you, uh, then you'll be truly wealthy when your motives are right and pure before me. I don't know the motives of my heart unless I seek the Lord. Then he says, and then white clothes to clothe you, to keep the shame of your nudity. Why do they have to be clothed? They think they're mature. We got it all together. But what they really are is they have never really grown. They're a state of an infant. Do you know what you have to do with an infant? You have to clothe them and you have to wipe their eyes and buy eyes off of their eyes. An infant has to have their eyes wiped, their body washed over, and they have to be clothed. So you say you're here, but you're really here. You know what the beautiful part about this is? Even if that's true, it can change in an instant. You can turn and be made whole immediately. Look at, that's why this is a good word. It says, therefore, listen to the amplified version of this. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love. Does that sound like he's angry? Or is, it, or is this his love trying to tell us, look, no more Ishmael. You want to come into my glory? You want to get into heaven, not just by escaping the fire? Do you want your life to be of value? Do you want it to be what I created it to be? Then therefore, those I dearly love, I tell them their faults, convict them, reprove them. I chasten them and I discipline and I, and, and I instruct them. Why have God's leaders lost that? Very simply, why is everything okay? You can just come as you are to the church. God loves you just the way you are. God loves you. He doesn't necessarily love the way you are because he wants to change the way you are into his image. You see what's happening with the churches today, mainline denominations, even charismatic churches today? There is a great falling away as Jesus predicted. They're going after another gospel. And so with that being known, he says, I discipline and instruct them. And listen to these words. So be enthusiastic and earnest and burning with zeal and repent. Does that sound like a little thing to you? It says, be enthusiastic and earnest and burning with zeal to repent. In other words, consider where you're falling from. And when you see it, Run as far away from it as you possibly can and repent and change. And the Lord now, after he finishes these speaking to the churches, all the local churches throughout history and up to this present day, everyone, he says this, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And now he's speaking to you. 
beyond your church denomination, your structure. He's not speaking to the churches as we've known it to be. He's speaking to every single part of his body of believers and saying, today, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears and listens and heeds what I'm saying, my voice, and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and they will eat with me. I will reveal myself to you as the king of glory. And now, where are the arising sons of God? Next scripture. For he that overcomes. And this is the message today to become arising sons of God. We've got to change what we're doing. We've got to see what God is building and what it's supposed to look like and what his desires are. He says, he who overcomes all of those things as a pastor, as a leader, as an individual, he that overcomes, I will grant him. I will give him permission to sit beside me on my throne as I myself overcame and sat down beside my father on his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear and heed what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. These are not my words. I'm not speaking on my own authority. I'm not saying this. The Lord said, speak about this today. I want you to speak about the church and lay, lay to see it. I am not here to church bash or to bash church leaders. And I don't want anyone who's on watching this broadcast to bash church leaders or to judge them incorrectly. We have no place to do that. What we are to do is to speak the truth in love. I'm not going to be ashamed of speaking what God has given me to shame, whether they, whether people like it, whether they don't, whether they like me, whether they don't. doesn't matter. I'm going to love them anyways. I'm not interested in bashing anything. But what God is putting is a trumpet in our mouth, and we're blowing the trumpet in Zion on God's holy mountain. And the Lord Jesus is standing in the midst of us and he's speaking a present word to us of repent, change, and be propelled. No, repent, change, and overcome. They correspond to the three prophetic words God gave me in 2020, 2021, and 2022. If you repent, you'll be prepared. If you change, you'll be positioned. If you overcome, you'll be propelled with glory. That is the present word and work of the Lord and why God is calling us to go to cities to converge so that those of you that are watching this broadcast, maybe by the spirit of God, will be drawn to come together in the gathering of the saints to meet the Lord the way that he wants to be met, to bring to the Lord what he desires so that God can change us, redirect us, empower us, enable us, and bring us up through that door in heaven in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, so that he can show us the things that are to come for your life, for your family, your children, your grandchildren, your churches, your ministry, your cities, your towns and states, so that he has a people equipped as an army of God with the new armor of the kingdom of God and the new weapons of today's warfare that God is giving us that will subdue the nations you know, and transform them into the kingdoms of our God along and following King Jesus. Be careful, beloved, even those of you that may have been called out, don't touch God's anointed. You don't touch them. I'm sorry. I'm not touching anybody tonight. You know why? I did. I did it. Who am I to, to accuse anybody? I'm just telling you what God showed me, what God told me, what he worked in me, and from his word of God, and what, he, and what he wants me to say to you who's watching this broadcast, that perhaps that this word would burn in the depth of your being as a Bible minister, that you would hear, wow, let me step back a minute, just for a moment. Lord, am I doing what you want? Is it mixed of flesh and spirit? Have I taken what you told me to do and I'm working it? Am I producing an Ishmael and not an Isaac? Can we at least ask that question? Can we at least ask God? And if he says, no, you're fine, then keep doing what you're doing. It's that simple. But maybe he'll say, yes, this is an Ishmael because your worth is attached to what you're doing. If I asked you to walk away from it, could you do it? If you never preached again, ministered again, would you be content with just being mine? Would you be happy just being mine? He may ask you questions like that. But why don't we do it now before it's too late? 
before when we stand in the Lord and everything we did gets burnt up like wood, hay, and stubble. I'd rather find out today what I'm doing is not right or pleasing to the Lord. Even though I'm trying to do what's right, I'd rather have him tell me it's not right. It's like a kid doing their homework. All right, they worked hard at turning that homework in and they, and they get nine wrong out of 10. And they're so disappointed. Well, I tried, I did my best. Why did I get nine wrong? And they're all upset because they got nine wrong. And they're mad at the teacher because they got corrected. What's the teacher supposed to say? It's right when it's wrong, right? Two and two equals seven? Just so I don't offend you and hurt your feelings? What kind of teacher is that? You got, you got nine wrong, Johnny, but I'm gonna show you how to get those nine wrong right. That's what repentance does. Once you realize you got nine wrong, he'll teach you how to get the nine wrong right. And that's where you'll change. And that's when you'll become an overcomer. Thank you, Lord. Father, I give you praise and honor today. Lord. You love your people. You love your local church gatherings. Lord, you love, well, Lord, you love the people that gather. But in, a, in Isaiah, Lord, you told them, I hate your gatherings. I hate your festivals. I hate your new moons. I hate your sacrifices. You said it right to them, Lord. Because they were not from their heart. It was not from the heart. The heart motives were not right. He said, they're appalling to me. I don't like them. I don't like your gatherings. Because you do it for yourselves to meet your own needs. And you don't meet mine. I know Israel and the leaders didn't want to hear that word of Isaiah either, Lord. And we individually may not want to hear, hear that, Lord. Because our worth has been built up in what we do for you. Come, Lord. Separate our worth from our work. So that we can hear you. So that you can correct us and teach us. And so that you told us in Malachi that you would come. The Lord that you seek would suddenly come to your temple. And who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For when he comes, he's going to come like a refiner's fire and full of soap. And you said, I'm going to thoroughly purge the sons of Levi. Why? Like gold and silver, pure gold and silver, that they may bring to me offerings of righteousness. Come, refiner's fire. Come, full of soap that we will be able to be refined like that gold and silver and remove everything in us that's not of you so that we can bring you what you want. We can minister to your heart and your needs that we can bring you offerings that you require, that you want. Not what I think you want, not what I wanna give you, but Lord, what you want me to bring to you out of love and obedience to you alone. And I pray that for all of us today, God. And I pray that for the ministers that may someday watch this broadcast, God, that they'll hear your trumpet voice. They'll hear you say, but you've deserted me, your first love. You're lukewarm. And if they are in that condition, God, or they're tolerating Jezebel, or they're like the church of Sardis, Lord, or wherever we are as a local church or as a minister or as a person, we would be enthusiastic and burn with repenting, I pray the release of the spirit of tears and true repentance and conviction to come upon those that watch this broadcast. Not pointing the fingers at others, but at a Lord allowing you to search our heart. Like David, we pray, search us, O God. Try us and know our thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in us. Search us, O God. Examine our motives, Lord, and purify our hearts' motives with your holy fire, that our life would become the reflection of your life, that you would be seen as full-grown sons, that we would reflect you in your kingdom, and that when they see us, they would see you. And now I pray a release, strengthening, supernatural impartation, Lord, to all of us, that this word would become flesh in our life's experience. Now to you who can do exceedingly above all that we think or ask, to you, Lord, be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, thank you, everyone, for staying on. This was much longer than I ever expected. But you don't stop when God is moving. You know, and if it's too long for people to watch, it's too long for people to watch. Those that God wants to watch it will watch it. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. I want to thank you for your encouragement, for your love, you know, and again, for those of you that are watching for the first time, they've asked me. Yeah, that's right, Donetta. That is really a powerful word. I didn't get to read all your comments. I'll go back and read them and I'll write comments on them later. So if you check later, I'll probably comment on all you wrote. I some of you wrote some beautiful comments, but I just couldn't stop where I was to read them. You know. But thanks, thanks to you. If you're watching for the first time and you know, people ask me, how can we bless you? We want to bless you financially. Well, we have a PayPal account. If you want to do that, you can do that. There's no strings attached. No one has to give. But if you feel led and God touches you, you know, and he wants you to do it, then we have that information for you. Also, our website is listed on there, I believe, too, that Lynn put our website. So if you want to check it out for us. And hopefully, as well, if you want to come to this Divine Convergence in New York, you know, you can go to the website and find it. Okay, it's under the events page. Okay, and if you click on it, it's filling up fast, you know, so really a lot of people are coming. So you, you might want to sign up because it's by invitation only and we only have a certain number of seats. And you may want to reserve your room now while you have the opportunity. But I encourage you to come to this convergence. You will be, what I'm sharing with you, you will experience. We will experience together. So you can have a taste of it. If you're a pastor and a leader, maybe that would be a really good thing that you come and you taste it and see for yourself. Come drink from the fountain of life and let the Lord, you know, work, work it in you because work, work and show you how his body functions together. It's not that, that, that there's something wrong with you. It's just to see the new wine skin and drink the new wine together. Amen. So if anyone needs anything, we can pray for you, serve you. We are here. My email is up there. and. You can contact us uh, even on our, you hit the, uh, I think it's the About Us. If you just hold it, there's a prayer request form you can fill out on there too. So check out our website. It's a, a blessing. I really appreciate every one of you that have been watching this. And those of you who've been faithful coming on with me every day, it's been a blessing. I'm learning like you. These words, I'm not preaching to everyone. God is speaking this to me. I'm being convicted in my life, just like we're in this together. This is not just like here, I'm, you know, like it's me trying to tell you something. No, God is speaking to us. I pray it's the spirit of prophecy speaking through me, but to me as well as all of us of what I need to change and what God needs to do in my life. I'm in this with you. We're together. We're all being changed. We all have areas of our life that need to come in alignment with God. So I don't say this from any place of judgment, but God does judge rightly, correctly. He sees perfectly and correctly. And he wants to give us his eyesight so that we see what he sees and his ears so that we can hear what he hears and his mouth so that we can speak what he speaks. Amen. Well, it's been a blessed week. I hope this was a blessing to you. We'll see you next Monday, same time, same station. Have a blessed weekend. And uh, um, uh, if you didn't get a chance to watch last night's uh, broadcast of preparing for New York, it was so it was powerful. You should hear the testimonies. Take time. It's a little longer, but it's worth watching. Watch a little here, a little there. It was incredible. You need to watch the broadcast. I hope you'll get a chance to do it. All right. We'll talk to you later. Love you all. Bye-bye.